company. So we're taking a little trip now uh, to Africa. We've got um, Gladys Kalamazikusuka joining us. She founded the award-winning NGO and nonprofit called Conservation Through Public Health. They promote biodiversity conservation by enabling people, gorillas, and other wildlife to coexist. So much of this work focuses on improving health and livelihoods uh, around protected areas in Africa, areas rich uh, in wildlife, and primarily the work is around endangered mountain gorillas of Buindi Impenetrable uh, National Park in Uganda. So I am going to bring Dr. Gladys in with us. Hi, Gladys. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. It is so good to see you. I know it's late in the evening for you. So thank you so much for joining us. And I know you've been doing a little bit uh, of travel as well. So I know you're probably uh, extra tired. So thank you uh, for joining us. And um, thank you for the work that you do. You do a lot of work around health um around the the national park and of course protecting uh the mountain gorillas as we know uh their populations are on the lower side so thank you so much for joining us today and sharing a little bit of your work thank you so much for inviting me i'm very excited to be here again um after the first the first festival was on in i think it was may last year thanks so much for inviting me joe <laughs> of, course. of course yeah uh, you're talking, we had, uh, last May, uh, the global biodiversity festival where we celebrate biodiversity over three days. We had 68 speakers from over 30 countries. We had, uh, uh, viewers from over a hundred countries tune in. We even produced a book from the event. So if you do want to check that out, I have a link here and we're gearing up to do it for a second year. We had so much fun last year, Gladys. We're going to do it again, uh, this year, uh, coming up in May. Great. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll let you take over for a little bit. Right, I'm gonna give a PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully it will, um, okay, I'll share the screen. <laughs> um, share screen, okay. Right, are you able to see my presentation? Uh, it didn't pop up yet. When you shared, did you pick uh, the presentation window or your whole screen? Oh, okay. Either one will work. Um, you just have to, you know, if you're doing your entire screen. Oh, there we go. I can see it coming up now. Okay, great. You've seen it coming up? Is it there up now? Go. Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, I'll start presenting. Well, thanks for inviting me for the Women Blaze Trails Festival. And it's great that there's the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. So this is a perfect time to have the festival. I've been working with mountain gorillas for about 25 years. And I've always been fascinated with primates. When I was growing up, I actually grew up in the capital city of Uganda in Kampala. So I grew up in the city. But we actually had, um, in those days, they used to allow velvet monkeys to be pets. So our next door neighbor, the Cuban ambassador, used to have a velvet monkey that used to come home and pull the cats and dogs tails, steal bananas. One time he played the piano and I was really fascinated. So ever since then, I've always been fascinated with primates. And after setting up a wildlife club in high school in Uganda, I really got into wildlife and I felt like I wanted to be a vet who works with wildlife. I'm really honored to become a National Geographic, Geographic Explorer. I became an explorer in 2018. And around the same time, I also became the Africa Chair for the Explorers Club, which it's great that the Explorers Club is part of this festival. And this year, last year, I was very humbled to win the 2020 Aldo Leopard Award from the American Society of Mammalogists. We founded Conservation Through Public Health in 2003 with my husband, Lawrence Iksoka and uh, vet technician, Stephen Rubanga, because of, we wanted to address threats to gorillas and other wildlife. Um, when I first studied, went to study gorillas, I went as a young scientist, a vet student, when I was 24. I went to Bwindi Impenetrable National Park over here. And one thing that can strike you when you just get to Bwindi is it's a very hard edge. I felt like I'd reached the ends of the earth, but I could not believe how hard the edge was. And this is because when it became a national park in 1992, people were not allowed to go in anymore 
and they could no longer cut trees, but gorillas also sometimes came out. And part of the reason for this hard age is the very high human population growth of about 300 people per square kilometer. And so making it a national park was really the last resort to save the mountain gorillas. And one thing that I realized that all over Africa, the gorillas are threatened by poaching and not necessarily for gorillas only, but for other animals in their habitats. But one, the reason I came to study the gorillas was as a vet student, I was looking at parasites and bacteria in their fecal samples and to see whether the, those visited by tourists were being affected than those who were not, which is an issue which has become very, very important right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's why I decided to focus my presentation on that. And this poor baby gorilla got scabies from people when the gorillas ranged outside the park, like over here, to eat people's banana plants. And they came across dirty clothing put on scarecrow to chase away gorillas, baboons, and other wildlife. The gorilla died, and the rest of the group only recovered after we treated them with ivermectin. And this was when I was working as a first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. So that made me realize very early on in my veterinary career that people are very key in conservation. And if we don't improve the health of the people, we won't be able to protect great apes and other wildlife effectively. So we started conservation through public health with three integrated programs, wildlife conservation, which is a big focus on wildlife health and habitat conservation, community health, where we have a one health approach to conservation, looking at zoonotic disease between people and wildlife and other issues which are related like family planning and improving community hygiene. And then we have the alternative livelihoods program where we found out that many people are unhealthy because they're poor and we started a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise, which I'll talk about later. So in our community health program, I actually designed these brochures in my last year at the Uganda Wildlife Authority as the first vet, because everybody felt that I was most qualified to do that, being the only vet in the organization. And then when we started the NGO, the nonprofit, we found that it was a great way of getting engaging women, because you're talking about health, and women are more involved in healthcare. And we found that health was a way of not only reducing threats to gorillas, but also improving people's attitudes to conservation because they felt you're caring about them and not only caring about the trees or the wildlife. And so this lady Hope was giving a talk in her community about how to be more healthy and hygienic and how to protect the gorillas and benefit more from them because this community has benefited greatly from gorilla tourism, which has lifted most people, a lot of people out of poverty. And so over here is, we started giving family planning injections because the Depo-Provera was the most popular contraceptive rather than the pill. And we joined together with Family Health International who were piloting this approach all over Uganda and we were one of their pilot sites. So I really have learned so much about public health through setting up conservation through public health. We carry out a lot of disease investigations and of course with wildlife, most of the time it has to be non-invasive and here we're training gorilla guardians and park rangers to collect fecal samples from the gorillas which build a nest every night and we analyze the samples for different things over here we're with students from robert college and dublin who are looking at uh, e coli in the gorillas and this is steven our other founder member then we started um because tourism is such a big activity and um, gorilla tourism is one of the most prominent tourism for great apes in Africa, both in Uganda and Rwanda. And I was hired actually because they felt that they didn't want people to make gorillas sick, new tourists with a fatal flu such as COVID-19. And that's the reason why I was hired in 1996. And when tourists arrive, if you get an opportunity to do this, and I hope Joe, you get an opportunity, you are only allowed to be, you're not allowed to be closer than seven meters. It, the distance kept increasing over the years. It started at five, then went to seven. And so this ranger, David, is giving a talk to tourists before they start trekking. But when we did research with Annalisa Weber and Professor Nancy Stevens from Ohio University, we found that 60% of the time, people got closer than not only seven meters, but three meters. And 40% of the time, the gorillas are the ones that broke the rules because they're so used to being near people. And some of them have seen people since they were born and they think they're just part of the ecosystem. So when the pandemic came around, we got, I got very, very concerned together with other NGOs here. Um, 
Mountain Gorilla Vet Project, International Gorilla Conservation Program, and Max Planck. And we got together with the Uganda Wildlife Authority to basically train the rangers to wear masks and to keep a social distance, which is the message that was going around all over the world. So it was easy to actually talk about it. And here the Bindi Community Hospital came in to train people to prevent COVID amongst themselves. And we started, we started the regulation of everyone has to have their temperature taken before they begin trekking. And the great thing is, even if in this photo I was, there were only two women in this photo, the same woman, Goretti, I took her tracking. And one thing I can say is that when I first started working with gorillas, there was no female ranger, and now 20% of the rangers are female. So we're really making some progress in that area, which is great. Um, one thing that I can also mention here is we joined the Uganda Ministry of Health Task Force. We've ever joined it before for anthrax outbreaks in hippos, Ebola, and other diseases that spread between people and wildlife. And so we joined the task force for COVID-19. And through it, we're able, we were able to lobby for the park staff to get tested for free. We're also able, although in the end it didn't happen, but they started to think about the importance of protecting gorillas um, to support the local communities and the national economy. And so when the president of Uganda started opening up the economy, after tourism was suspended and lockdowns all over the world, he said, we'll wait for, to open up for gorillas and chimps because we don't want to make our cousins sick. I was very pleased to hear that in the national address. Very, very pleased. Um, so most recently, we are lobbying for the park staff to be among the first to be vaccinated when the COVID vaccine eventually arrives in Uganda, hopefully in April. So that would be one very important way to protect the gorillas and chimps from COVID-19. And because we gorillas are always going outside the park, they don't know that there's COVID, we trained our gorilla guardians who herd gorillas back in how to prevent COVID between themselves and to herd them back when they're wearing masks and maintaining a 10 meter distance. Because during the pandemic, the distance increased to 10 meters and you have to disinfect your boots and wash your hands often. And over here, the community conservation warden, Barbara was giving a talk and this is Stephen demonstrating how to use an infrared thermometer. Um, we've also given infrared thermometers to the gorilla guardians. And then we went back to our group of community volunteers, the village health and conservation teams and developed a poster with support from Solidaridad and ACAS Foundation, talking about how to prevent disease between people and gorillas and calling out the people. And we gave them soap as well. And this all happened as early as March 2020, um, which really helped because now the COVID rate has actually gone up a lot, not only all over the world, but also in Uganda. And one area that we started to realize is that poaching was actually beginning to go up because there were no tourists and people were desperate. So the head of ride for a woman, Evelyn, she set it up together with her husband, Dennis. I called her and asked her, Evelyn, are you able to make masks for the, for the rangers? Because Uganda had run out of surgical masks and someone from CDC said cloth masks can work almost as well, double layered cloth masks. So at least some people were able to be employed during the pandemic, in spite of you know, others who are completely stuck, especially the windy community that totally depends on tourism. Um, we started the Gorilla Conservation Coffee Social Enterprise in 2016 to basically help farmers who border the park, prevent them going into the park to poach, to collect firewood, because they weren't getting a fair market or a good price for their coffee. So even as you're tracking gorillas, you cross coffee farms. And we didn't really know what to do in when the COVID pandemic came around, because tourists stopped coming to Uganda. And this is the Entebbe International Duty Free Shop, which was ordering coffee every week and only placed an order in March 2020 and then later on in December 2020. And in between March and December, we had to find a way to keep the farmers busy so that they don't end up going back to the park to poach. And so one thing that we did is we found a buyer in the UK, Manny Row Beans, this is Vicky. She, it was amazing to find her. We found her after I gave a talk at the Media Hub in Cookham in November 2019. And Lawrence, who I traveled with my husband, was able to convince them that we're really looking for a distributor in the UK. So Vicky came around and she's actually placed seven orders of coffee since May 2020, which is pretty amazing. So some of the parks, some of the farmers around the park have been able to earn a living, and that's fewer people going into the forest to poach. We have a distributor in America, Pangos.com, who have just placed an order after, after a few many months after the pandemic began, because there were lockdowns to America. And you can place an order with, with John Probat after this presentation. 
And what, though, though we had a big setback with uh, Rafiki, he was the lead silverback of Nkuringo Gorilla Group, one of the first groups to be habituated for tourism in Bwindi, and especially in the southern sector. He was killed by a poacher. And gorilla poaching is very, very rare in Uganda because people benefit so much from tourism. But now in the absence of tourism, nine years later, Rafiki has been killed. It was such a shock. And the group broke up. And the next thing was like, how could someone kill a gorilla during a pandemic? That was the first question that came into my mind. How could someone kill a gorilla when they've done so much for the community of Windy? I mean, basically, they totally depend on tourism, many of them. Um, so we went over. Um, we went over to check on Rafiki's group one month after he was killed. And it was a bit strange, you know, I went with the rangers and the group was beginning to settle down, but five of them had left to go to another group. The oldest blackback Ramutwe was now um, looking after the group. That's Ramutwe over here. And, uh, and when we checked on them, um, they were kind of like, very wary because of what had just happened, but as the months went by, they started to settle down, which we were really pleased about. And I have some good news to share with you about them at the end of the presentation. But what really touched me is this porter. He, he, he was the first porter who had had a job since May 2020. And we went in August. And he was wearing a, a mask talking about Rafiki in memory of Rafiki. So we found that as much as this a poacher from his community killed a gorilla, most of them were very shocked and sad about it. And we realized that actually these people are really suffering and they're poor. And this poacher who killed the gorilla, um, this photo was provided by the Uganda Wildlife Authority. He's been put in jail for 11 years, which is the longest anyone has ever been put in jail for killing a gorilla or any species of wildlife in Uganda. So it was a step forward for conservation. However, people are hungry and desperate. And as long as they're hungry, they're still going to enter the park to poach. So we got some funding from IUCN and individual donors and we started to support the communities to have fast growing seedlings that can grow within one to four months so that they can eat while they wait for tourism to begin. And, and even when tourism comes back, which it started to come back at a very slow rate, um, still because of lockdowns, they still don't have to depend on tourism to survive. They can actually have food to eat and the money from tourism can go to support other things. And however, we also provided seedlings to the wife of this poacher, who's among the poorest of the poor in the community. She has three children under the age of three years old. Just today, I got these photos for my team in Bwindi. I'm actually not in Uganda at the moment. I'm in another country training paravets, but um, in Burundi. But this particular, um, we've just been having meetings with the reform poachers who, this poacher refused to join the reform poacher group, the one who killed Rafiki. But a lot of them have given up their tools. They're like, wow, being jailed for 11 years, that's so scary. I'm on the board of the guerrilla organization. And they, when we had a board meeting, they told us they've been also supporting reform poachers. And they were like, this guy laid out his tools, Gillian Miller told us. And so we're telling them to discourage people from poaching. And we're helping to find them alternative livelihoods, like livestock income generating projects, so that they can keep out of the forest, or even getting engaged in guerrilla conservation coffee. So the youngest mother in Rafiki's group, this is actually Rafiki's youngest offspring since he died, was born in January this year, which is really, we're really pleased about, Nderema. And so the group has now grown from, is now 12, which is great. They, they dropped from 17 to 11 when Rafiki died, and now they're growing to 12. And we're very, very excited about this. Actually, there's been a baby boom at Bwindi in general. Um, at least three times as many gorillas have been born in 2020 as opposed to other years. We don't know why. Um, it's a very interesting area of research, but all these gorillas were conceived before the pandemic began. So it's pretty interesting what's going on there, but it's very encouraging that in spite of a pandemic, the animals are bouncing back. And maybe they're bouncing back because there's very few tur tourists coming in, we don't know. So how could you support our work? As I mentioned, just by buying a bag of gorilla conservation coffee, you're able to support our work and keep more farmers out of the forest who would otherwise be poaching and you know possibly disrupting the gorillas and their habitat you can visit us once you're vaccinated and the pandemic is being more closely managed you can sign up for our e-newsletter follow us on social media and you can donate through our website ctph.org and when you come you see this amazing view of the top of the bindi forest thank you so much
Joe and all the team at Exploring from the seat of your pants. And for more information, visit our websites, also the coffee website, and follow me and my organization on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you. And Instagram. All right. Uh, Gladys, thank you. Thank you for, you know, not only the work you were doing before the pandemic, but you know, you really kicked things into high gear to make sure that the gorillas were still being protected and that, um, you know, people in the local community still had a form of livelihood while we wait for that tourism uh, to return. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, and the coffee sounds incredible. So I do hope that um, people tuning in live, check out that site in the UK, check out the site in the US uh, to find that great uh, source of coffee. So, you know, we hear a lot about um, transmission of, of disease from animals to humans, but, you know, we don't hear a lot in the news about humans actually transferring disease the other way. So I think that's, you know, another important thing. We are so closely related to the gorillas uh, that we do have that ability to transfer disease to them as well. So very interesting. Yes. <laughs> So Gladys, what, um, we have a lot of viewers tuning in uh, who are um, graduate students, who are university students, and they're just kind of starting to find their way in the world of conservation um, and thinking about projects they might want to jump into. Do you have any advice that you would give them after your years working in a, uh, an NGO and building it? What kind of advice would you give them? Um, I think the advice I would give them is to you know, just jump in. Like I first got involved, I set up a wildlife club in the high school when I was 18. And then I had an opportunity at the vet school I was at to study an animal of my choice. And so I came to Uganda and did research. And I really feel that if students want to get involved in conservation and wildlife protection, you really need to, it's good to start to get in as a researcher, a research assistant or a researcher yourself because you really get to understand so many issues. Like when I did my research at Windy under the supervision of a vet called Dr. Liz McPhee, who was heading the International Gorilla Conservation Program, um, it was just amazing because I was in a tourist site and I got to understand how tourism is doing so much for the local community. And this in turn is helping to protect the gorillas. It's helping them to tolerate the gorillas and to appreciate them. And if I hadn't gone out there to do this research, uh, it wouldn't have happened. So. It's just good to just get out to the field and be open-minded and see if that's what you really want to do. And of course, I, I've learned so much as well, learning from the local communities, how to engage with them. They always know what's better for them than you. You're only there to guide them. And I've had that also in the previous presentations. And although I'm Ugandan, I'm not from the part of Uganda where the gorillas are found. So I've also learned how to you know, adjust and learn how things are done in another part of the country. So yeah, that's very important. And actually one thing I forgot to mention in my presentation is gorillas, all the time we were worried about gorillas getting COVID, they actually got COVID in San Diego Zoo. Gorillas got COVID from the symptomatic keeper and this has put us on even more high alert about you know, spreading diseases from people to gorillas and you know, really being very responsible when doing, conducting tourism so that you really have to, people have to really respect the 10 meter distance and wear their masks. So that's the latest update that has happened. And this happened in January, just last month. <laughs> okay, that was gonna actually be my next question is have there been any recorded cases, but it sounds like in captivity, uh, there definitely has, that, that transmission has happened. Yes, and San Diego Zoo has been great at engaging us and other conservationists working with gorillas in the wild and great apes to share their learnings and we are, we are really learning a lot from them because it has implications for looking after them in the wild as well. <laughs> yeah. Now through your organization or maybe similar uh, organizations, do you intervene um, when you see an animal that may be sick or hurt? Uh, do you intervene to help in those situations? Yes, we do. Um, for the mountain gorilla specifically, you intervene when it's human related or life threatening. And because there are so few in number, so it's not like other wildlife where you say, oh, okay, you know, the warthog is the next meal for the lion. It's not quite the same with gorillas. There's so few in number, and we generally tend to intervene whenever it's human-related or life-threatening because they're so critically endangered. And so in the case of COVID-19, we definitely have to intervene 
probably have to quarantine the one group that has it, because even with San Diego Zoo, all of them got it in that group, and then the rest not allow them to mix with others and then treat them like that. But it's much harder treating them in the wild than in captivity, and so it's much better that they don't get any contagious diseases like COVID-19. With the scabies, it was like they got to know who I was and they wouldn't allow me to come near them to give them a second dose of ivermectin. They really got clever. <laughs> All right. They're not too different from us. They don't love those uh, visits from the doctor as much as some, some of us feel that same way too. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. So uh, Gladys, um, what's, what, what's next for you? Is there another big project on the horizon? Um, or do you have enough uh, to focus on right now? Is there something that uh, you're hoping to maybe get off the ground as, as maybe, you know, uh, a vaccine does start to reach more areas, maybe tourism starts again? Is there a future project in the pipeline? Uh, yes, well, well, we have many projects in the pipeline, but currently as regarding the gorillas and pandemic, um, we were looking for funding to provide fast growing seedlings to more homes. There's about 6,000, so we need to provide seedlings to another 5,000. We tried to reach the 1,000 in the area from where the poacher came from. Um, we're also testing the gorillas for COVID-19, which is very expensive actually. So we're looking for funding for that. And we've supported the Wildlife Authority also to test the park staff for COVID. But right now, actually what's more important is trying to make sure that everyone gets vaccinated who, got, who comes close to the gorillas. And we're working closely with the Ministry of Health and Uganda Wildlife Authority to make sure that they get vaccinated. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, so those are the main things. But we also seeing our approach to the West, the Eastern Lowland Gorillas in DRC. We got some support from St. Andrew's Prize for the Environment, who won the prize in February last year. And once the, it's safe to travel to DRC, um, we'll definitely try and get the same model that we have at Windy up and running very well with the Eastern Lowland Gorillas of DRC, which unfortunately their numbers are decreasing because you know, there's no tourism, people kill gorillas if they come in their gardens. It's a very different situation. But in Uganda and Rwanda and where the mountain gorillas are found, at least they, they are much more protection and partly because of tourism. Actually, tourism has a lot with protecting wild, wild species all around the world. <laughs> all right. So I just popped um, the website up to your organization uh, in a bar along the bottom of the screen. So I do, Thanks. you know, hope you will check it out and help out where you can because it is really great work. Uh, that you are doing, and I'm not surprised that um, you know you have been successful in in getting some awards and grants. And of course, we wish you the best uh, in these challenging times, and look forward to a time when you know tourism can start again. Because when done right, tourism really can do a lot to help conservation. Yes, it really can, and we look forward to having hosting in Uganda one day, Joe. Oh, no <laughs> and question. Get to meet the kids we also work with. We work with children around the national park. <laughs> I cannot wait for that day. I will be there when we when we can do that. Absolutely. Gladys, thank you so much. It was great to see you. Um, thank you for joining us, sharing your work. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. We look forward to our next live connection together. Thank you so much. <laughs>